Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on machine learning for leaders. This session is co-hosted by the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and Harvard Kennedy School's Executive Education. We are thrilled to have with us Professors Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Viegas. Martin and Fernanda both hold Professorship of Computer Science at the Harvard School of Engineering and joint appointments at Harvard Business School. Fernanda also has an appointment at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. Martin and Fernanda joined Harvard in 2021 and 2022 respectively. And they were former employees together at Google and longtime collaborators. While at Google, they found co-founded Google's People and AI Research Initiative, also known as PEAR. This initiative, um, the goal of it was to advance research in the design of people-centric AI systems. And this research also helped to define the field of visualization, creating interactive and open source tools for examining a wide range of scientific, social, and artistic questions. We are delighted to have them here with us today. Martin and Fernanda, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're delighted to be here. Um, I would like to say also that some of this material was created when we were at Google, we're using that with permission, but none of this should be taken as Google's opinions on stuff. There's a lot that we've put in here as, as Harvard professors as well. Um, we still retain an affiliation there. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the idea of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Next slide. So we hear the term AI a lot, and I want to actually just start with a comment on it that there, you know, as a technical uh, person, I, I would love to start out with a technical definition of AI, but there's not really one. It's basically a very convenient, informal term. It does not have a, an agreed on technical meeting. Um, it's fun to argue about what it means, but instead, you know, in terms of uh, technicalities, I want to talk about machine learning, and that's really a good way to think about this. Next slide. So machine learning really does have a precise meaning, next, um, which is that anything that lets software learn behavior from example data rather than programming rules, okay? And as we're gonna see, this is something that gives it both a lot of power and possibility, but also can be very, has a lot of subtleties and can cause interesting issues. Next slide. So why would you even want to use machine learning. Like in a way you could say, well, rules are nice. They're very controllable, created by people. And a really good example of this is thinking about the case of spam filtering. Uh, you know, if there's a lot of email, a lot of it is just bad trying to market you things you don't want um, or worse. And a classic problem for computers is how can you filter out the bad email, the spam, um, from the good email. So the very first programs to do this were basically based on rules. Next slide. Uh, and the slide, and people would write these things by hand. You know, they would notice, okay, there's a lot of bad email I don't care about that contains the word credit card. And you would have these programs that would contain a whole bunch of if statements trying to guess, okay, what is going to make an email good or bad? Next slide. Um, but the problem with that is that it just kind of doesn't scale. It turns out that for one thing, in the case of spam, you're really uh, you know, dealing with adversaries who are gonna be clever and realize that maybe if they put a three instead of an E in credit card, they'll defeat your filter. Uh, in addition, you know, this might work for English spam, but then the moment you're dealing with another language, you'd have to have a whole nother complicated if statement. Okay, so in general, it, it, it turned out not to work that well. Next slide. So what does work well is if you learn the pattern yourself, if you don't expect to have, you know, for each language and each set of spam types, a human sitting there and writing a bunch of rules, but instead you can gather spam email, maybe it's just reported by your users, so it's easy to get a lot of it. And you have, it's labeled as like this email was good, or maybe you can tell some email um, you know, is good because people uh, answered it. And then there's other label that 
your users tell you is spam. And next slide, it then is able to look at all of those um, things and create a mathematical representation of what is different between the good and bad emails. Maybe it's looking at distributions of words, maybe it picks out anything with you know numbers instead of letters in a tricky way. You don't have to know this is the beauty of it. As a human, you can set the computer to solving the task for you. Next slide. Okay, so then having learned those it will be able to classify the emails. And this is an important uh, term in machine learning. It's this idea of you're looking at something complicated, like an entire text, and you're boiling it down into a choice or maybe a probability. And again, this is an important realization about machine learning is very often your answer is not just a yes or no, but it's a probability. Uh, I might say that this is 93% likely to be spam and you can deal with it appropriately. Next slide. Um, and then this is the other nice thing about machine learning is that not only, you know, if you have a program, you can always be refining it in a way you can, as, as new data comes in, as your adversaries are, you know, coming up with new ways, if they find some way to somehow slip past your filter, you can automatically apply the same learning process that you had to uh, create this. Um, to make it better, to constantly refine it. So this idea of constant refinement is very important. Next slide. Okay. So now that Martin talked you through some of the basics about how these machines learn from example data, right? What I want to do is I want to give you a live demo of a machine learning system learning literally on the fly as, as we're um, learning here. So what I'm about to show you is a website called Teachable Machine. It's public something that was uh, made at Google, uh, not by our team, but by a sister team. Uh, work uh, running on your browser and trying to do image classification. So basically the only task I'm going to ask this machine learning system to do is to classify three different kinds of images. That's all it's going to learn how to do right now. Okay, so I just switched to my little demo. So let me walk you through very quickly what's happening on this screen. So. On here on the left, you can see you can see me talking to you right now. So this is a live camera. I'm just using my webcam, and this is my image. My live uh, live image is the input for our system. Here in the middle, it's kind of the guts of our system. Okay, uh, and our system, as I said, all it's going to do is to learn how to differentiate, classify three different kinds of images. So I have the green kind of image here. I have the purple one, and I have the orange one. That's all it is. I will explain. I will come back to this in a moment. On the right, I have the output. So this is the result of my system. Once it decides, oh, I know what that image is, it will, it will show us these little animated GIFs. So I'm gonna go from face and orange and banana. Okay, this is sounding a little weird. Let me get started. So hopefully you will see how this works. All I have to do is to click on one of these buttons. So I'm gonna click on the green button now. And it's taking literally what it's doing. I'm moving my head a little bit and it's taking images of me, of the input. And it's deciding, okay, whenever I see an image like that, it's going to be number one. It's going to be my little face image. Oh, it's seen from the world. So, so far, so good. It's 99% sure that there is a face there and it's right because I am, I am there. Okay, my second little prop, I brought props in today, is, a, is an orange. And so now I'm going to train my second kind of image. So I'm going to click on the purple button and I'm gonna say, hey, system, look, this is an orange. Look, I'm going to move the orange. So it sees the orange in different parts of the, of the image. And I think it's trained. So now it's decided it's a, it's a face. Now, oh, I have an orange and it's 99% sure that it's an orange. Okay, no orange, orange. Okay, my system is brilliant. It's working really, really nicely. 
Okay, if I go like this, orange, if I start to put the orange behind me, oh, it's getting confused. Is there an orange there? Maybe, maybe not. I'm trying to trick it. I am putting the orange way behind me. Okay, now I'm gonna train my third and final kind of image. And that's where I bring my second prop. I'm gonna click the orange button and I'm going to show a banana. And I'm like, okay, here's a banana, here's a banana. Here system, look, it's a banana. Okay, so now let me pick up my props. I have a face, banana, orange. Okay, my system is doing very well. I have a perfect system that's working. Uh, what happens if I put both of these? It's deciding it's a banana. What if I bring the orange closer? It's deciding it's an orange. Now it's a little bit confused because I have both at the same time and I have my face. Now what happens if I, you know, I can start playing with this. Um, let's try another thing. What if I turn my banana? What if I only show part of the banana? Oh, it's getting confused. Look, it decides there is a, it's, it's the face. There is no banana in the picture anymore, but certainly there is a banana. What is going on here? Look, it's like, I have a, the most, the biggest part of the banana is here and it hasn't seen a banana. What is going on? Okay, so what's going on here is the fact that my training data, in my training data on purpose, I was only showing the system, the banana, in this orientation. And even though I moved the banana around, I never showed it in this orientation, okay? And so it's breaking. It doesn't recognize the banana very well at all when it's turned this way. What can I do? This is the moment when I realize, oh, let me train it more. So now let me click here. I'm going to show the banana in that orientation. I'm gonna go over here. I'm going to go over here again. I am going to show the banana in many different ways, upside down, in front of me, whichever way. Okay, now let's try again. Orange, banana. Do I have a banana here? Yes, I have a banana. Okay, I just made my system that much more robust because my training data is much more diverse, right? It sees the banana this way, it sees the banana this way. Look, it even understands there is a banana that way. This is super important. The fact that I have now improved my training data uh, by making it more diverse is incredi incredibly important. So now let's go back to the slides and let's think about what just happened. You know, what led to errors in the, in, in, in the model? As I was saying, the fact that my training data was not all that robust really mattered um, for the kind of, of um, model performance you saw. And that is true across the board, okay? You need to be very careful about the quality and robustness and diversity um, of your data. Okay, a final word on how um, ML development uh, typically works today. It involves, it tends to involve a lot of reuse. So there's reuse of data sets and there is reuse of machine learning models, pre-trained models. What do I mean by that? So for instance, data sets. The kinds of data sets that we use today for a lot of machine learning, tends, it tends to be large. Uh, these data sets tend to be large and expensive. They are time consuming and expensive to create. So once you create a good, you know, um, comprehensive, if you will, data set, it's really useful if other people can reuse your data set. So that happens a lot. Sometimes um, the data set is very general, like images of the world. But then imagine if I have a very specific case, use case, like I am a doctor and I want to, I'm curious, I'm interested in medical image data sets. That's going to be a very different kind of data set. So then you need to create those from scratch. Okay. All of these things will have implications on some of the policy needs that I think we're going to hopefully talk about later on. On the machine learning model side, um, you know, Cloud um, and on-device platforms um, offer AI products with, which may be used with no modification. So for instance, uh, if you go to a cloud service, they will say, hey, we have these image classification models here. This is really good for um, 
Kathy, you have a question? Okay, um, this is really good for uh, object classification. This other one is really good for gesture classification. So you have different kinds of models that have been trained and are good to go, or you have a language model or a translation model, okay? Um, and so, and, and also like a lot of times, even if you're not using a cloud service, you're doing everything yourself, chances are you are going to be reusing some of these pre-trained models that have already been trained, by the way, what I was doing with teach Teachable Machine with the with my little props here, I was reusing a pre-trained image classification model, okay? And I was just training it again. So this is the power of reusing uh, these models. Okay, over to you, Martin. Great, okay. So we've seen here classification um, and it might seem like that's a very simple capability, just deciding to look at something complicated like an image, spam email, classify it into one of a few classes. But it turns out this same basic idea um, has all sorts of ramifications. And one that I wanna sort of spotlight is the idea of generation, which may seem very different of how do you might generate text. But in fact, it's going on in, in roughly the same way if you imagine a, like a model that can predict thousands of classes instead of just a few, then you could use it to do all sorts of things. One of the prime examples as much in the news these days is the idea of predicting a word given a previous set of text. So like a sentence completion task, or you could think about it as autocomplete. And if you can do that, you can just keep doing it. Basically, you can say, well, given a few words, I'm going to, you know, predict the next word, then I'll predict the next word based on that. And that can enable generation of long sequences, uh, sequences of prose, of software code, and so forth. And an important point here is that even though generation may seem like this dramatically different capability from classification, you should think about it as having the same general properties, that it's training data that drive the performance, just as you saw you know, a, the location of a banana in Fernanda's demo. Bias is an issue, you know, if your training data is not complete, if the banana is not shown everywhere on screen, that will cause problems. There's very analogous stuff happening in language as well. And as you saw in the demo, the results are often noisy and it's like things will often sometimes work, but not reliably. Now on the next slide, let's drill down on this. So you might ask, why does generating text matter at all? You know, why do you care about predicting the next word in a phrase or generating text? So next slide. The answer is it turns out that it's a far more powerful task than you might think. And so I've got a couple of examples here. Imagine auto-completing a sentence that says, I saw the Red Sox play at and if you know the answer, what stadium they're likely to play at or what you know set of stadiums if they're playing away games, you suddenly realize, wow, I had to have a whole lot of geographic and cultural knowledge in order to be able to complete that sentence. Or you could have a sentence that just involves math, a little bit of arithmetic. And you realize, wait, in order to complete that sentence, I either have to, had to see that problem before, or maybe if the numbers are large, I would actually have to do a little bit of arithmetic in my head. And one of the um, kind of fascinating insights from the last sort of few years of development is that simply training a system to do what is basically fancy autocomplete causes the system to have to learn to perform all sorts of different tasks which can be interesting in their own right. And what then that turns out to have this sort of very surprising implication that you can tackle all sorts of problems. That if you have a system that's capable of completing sentences in a somewhat reliable way, then you could give it geographic problems and get the answer. Um, one classic example, there's a system called GPT-3 created by OpenAI in 2020, which really you know, caused a lot of excitement in this field. If people realize, for example, you could ask it to translate from English to French, you could even just give it a few examples of translations, and then it would be able to do its own translation, even though it had not been trained to do translation, just by learning to autocomplete a bunch of web pages, basically, that happened to have a lot of English, happened to have a lot of French, it had learned to do this specific task. Um, so this has caused a lot of excitement. Um, there's some terms you might see uh, 
in the news, you know, this, this particular phenomenon is given many names from large language models, foundation models, base models, but they all have the same idea that by pre-training on a simple sentence completion task ends up giving um, these things a lot of capabilities that are very surprising and often seeming to be very powerful. Okay, so this gives you a general idea of how moving from something simple like classifying an orange to a banana very quickly moves you up the ladder to a world of being able to do very complex things. Okay, so that raises another issue. How do we develop material responsibly? So next slide. And I wanna talk a little bit about this question of principles. Um, so it turns out there's many, many principles. There are people uh, at all sorts of organizations who are developing ways to think about the ethics, about the right thing to do, given the power of AI. And let's talk a little bit about what these things have in common, what they don't. So next slide. Um, I want to sort of make the point that many, many groups are interested in this. And I think they all have something interesting to say. And I've spotlighted uh, three examples of principles that you can find on the web today. And you know, you might expect maybe the OECD to have principles around AI in a sense, you know, key you know, set of countries thinking about what's right and regulation that you might expect. Um, what about the Department of Defense? They too have a whole set of principles. Um, and you know, if they generally it's like there's a lot they need to be thoughtful of you can imagine and then there are things that you might you'd be a little more surprised at for example there's a number of religious organizations that have tried to come up with their own AI principles now there's a whole question here do we need entirely new principles in fact there's a you know, Kennedy School uh, publication, I believe, that has the phrase AI principle pro proliferation, um, which, you know, asks the question, what do we do given all these principles? But I think there's a lot in here to learn from. So next slide. And I think we can learn a lot in particular, not just by seeing what are the things people care about, but looking at the commonalities and differences between these groups. Um, one thing that you'll see in basically every set of principles I've looked at is their concerns about fairness and bias. Those are more or less universal. Transparency. And almost all, all cases, we'll talk about centering humans in some way um, as opposed to machines. In some cases, things other than humans as well. But in general, people don't want AI to be the center of what's going on, but they want the purpose of AI to be important. What can AI do for the world? There are also differences as well. Um, you know, it, I, I've looked at a bunch of um, corporate statements of principles, and I don't think I've ever seen one about sexuality. Whereas uh, when you look at religious organizations, this actually is a concern. In the case of Department of Defense, uh, you'll see that there's a deep focus on traceability of decisions, responsibility. And I think there's actually a lot to learn from that in high stakes situations in general. And so I think what we see right now is there's this strong, uh, the very robust, robust debate going on. Um, and the thing, if I would have any message about this debate, it would be that we should look at as broad a range as organizations as possible. Um, you know, don't just think about what governments say, what companies say, but really thinking about, okay, what are the faith-based uh, questions? What are the questions in ultra high stakes situations? All of these I think are very important. Over to you for a moment. Okay. So as part of this as, as Martin is saying, as, as part of this debate around, you know, responsible use of AI or principles, um, one of the things that I think we can, uh, one of the things we deeply believe in is the need for things like documentation. You may think that these things are kind of the basics and everybody does it. People don't do it. Uh, and if you remember what I was saying before, which is, a lot of the technology gets reused, both on the data side and on the model side. Um, so it's great that we get to reuse these resources, that people make these resources available. A lot of these things are also available in open source, um, okay, communities. One of the major problems is uh, if you are reusing these massive data sets and you don't even know what's inside of them, 
That's a major problem. If you don't know uh, the distribution of things in your in the data set that you're using to train your model, um, how are you expecting the model to you know work in certain situations, not work in other situations? It's very hard. Um, the same thing goes for models. If you are reusing a pre-trained model, which which a lot of times that's exactly what happens. Wouldn't you like to know how this model performs under different circumstances? Or why was this model created and pre-trained to start with? What data did it train on? All sorts of things that in a sense uh, feel very basic and low hanging fruit, but that there is no mandatory anything about uh, about having kind of like the way I think about this is like nutrition labels. So if we could do nutrition labels for both data sets and machine learning models, shouldn't we be doing this, right? So there are places, like there are initiatives, but it's very ad hoc. So for instance, Google has a, a whole set of things happening around data cards and model cards. Um, but, you know, it's not definitely a given and it's not across the board. And I think this is a start, something to think about that, that um, where if we could level the playing field, that would, that would be great. Um, okay, so that brings us this other question related to responsible uses of AI is the notion of explainability. Can we explain the outputs of a, of a machine learning system? Um, and one of the questions that you want to be asking yourselves right away is, is not just one general question. Can you explain uh, the output of, of a system? It's what is this explanation for? Whom is this explanation for? And what do we mean by explain? Because these things are going to change dramatically. An explanation for a machine learning engineering engineer or a machine learning expert is going to look very different than an explanation for an end user or a regulator, right? And so those things matter. Uh, whoever it is, who is the human we're explaining things to really matters. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is that it's useful to think that, to think along the lines of an explanation is a means to an end. So not just why should you have explanations, but they should be tailored, as I was saying, to different actors and different uses. So, you know, the developers are going to need a, a systems to improve the systems. So there is a whole lot of, of research and um, you also want a different kind of explanation or interpretability, if you will, that helps you identify potential sources of errors or biases. Now, these are going to be important for developers, but they're also going to be important, hopefully, to a broader set of, of uh, social actors, right? Not only experts. Um, and you also want to empower users, end users even, with relevant and useful explanations. So the end users, even though they are not machine learning experts, they may not even care that machine learning is part of the product they're using. Um, it, it does make sense to be thinking about how do you surface some of the limitations of these systems to end users so that they can make whatever decisions they need to make to use the, the product in the best way possible, in the best, most informed way possible. And so notice that, that, for instance, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, for end users, uh, notions like radical transparency or full transparency are not helpful. They tend to be way overwhelming and actually not helpful and stressful to users. This has been proven, and there are many user studies that, that show this. So you really need to be careful about um, explaining to end users the things that they can act on and the things that, and again, limitations they should be aware of. So there's a whole range of different kinds of explanations you might be one to be thinking about. The other question that comes up a lot is this notion of, is machine learning a black box, right? Everybody talks about it as a black box. Well, 
actually, it's not inherently a black box. It's a complex box. <laughs> but the good news is that we can design tools and techniques actually for understanding these models. These images you see on the right are actually some screenshots of work that um, our team um, at Google had done uh, years ago. Um, and that get used both at Google and outside. These things are available in open source uh, for anyone to use. Um, there are, again, this is a very active area of, of research. So there are new techniques and new tools being developed um, constantly. Um, and um, one of the things to think about is that sometimes you may not be able to explain the entire system or explain all of the predictions and decisions of a system, but you might be able to explain a specific decision or a specific forecast or a specific point. Um, and so to keep in mind the trade-offs and what this area looks like and, and what can be expected, I think it's, it's important. And the other thing, the, the other question that comes along with this is, can we identify sources of error and biases? And yes, in some cases we can. Already, again, there are tools that exist. There are interpretability tools. Um, there are um, tools and techniques that are looking specifically at the data sets. There are tools and techniques to, that look at the models themselves. Um, and so, again, a lot happening in this area. One of the things I'm always very excited about is when these tools and techniques don't expect you as a user to have to code like engineers to do this. So this is one of the things that I, I'm always very excited. What are the tools that a broader set of stakeholders can use to probe these systems in critical ways and to understand, oh, wait a second, I don't like the answers here. What's going on here? There is some, something weird. There is this behavior is strange. Let's probe it. And I don't need to be a software engineer to, to do that. I think that's important. Okay, uh, Martin, I think now we're going to switch gears. Yes, so we'd like to end with a case study because I think a lot of this can seem fairly abstract and uh, it's nice to actually see some specifics. So next slide. Let's talk about a particular problem. Um, and that problem, it's a medical problem. There's a, 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 a disease called diabetic retinopathy, which I'm gonna abbreviate as DR. It's uh, something associated with diabetes. Uh, you can tell from the name. And it's the fastest growing cause of preventable blindness. So the situation is that if you have this and it's diagnosed early, doctors actually know exactly what to do to prevent you from going blind. However, there are so many people who are in the early stages that there are not enough doctors um, to actually diagnose people. So th there's a real issue there of like, we know how to fix this. We know how to keep people from going blind, but we don't have the resources yet to do this. Okay, so next slide. Um, and, you know, just to, you know, give an example is in India, there's a shortage in the six figures of eye doctors to diagnose this. And so almost half of patients lose some vision before they get diagnosed. Okay. So let's think about this as a target for machine learning. Um, and if I, if I look, ask yourself, what does diabetic retinopathy look like? Um, actually, can we go to the, yes, okay. Uh, so this is, here's why this is a hard problem, is that basically the way it's diagnosed is you shine a light into someone's eye, you take a photo at the back of the eye, and a healthy eye looks like the image on the left in that circle and a less healthy eyes on the right. And you can see that uh, the difference is this very subtle set of like little brown dots in a sea of brown. It's very hard to learn how to do this. Um, it's just a difficult thing. Uh, next slide. And in fact, it's even hard for doctors to do this. Uh, you know, it's like they have this whole scale, but they tend to disagree. Next slide. Um, and so the issue is that let's say that I have a given patient and I ask five different doctors to rate that person, whether they have diabetic retinopathy or not, they may not agree, um, next slide. And in fact, uh, what you may see is that as they go through more and more patients, those disagreements are just going to persist. So the point here is that 
um, not only is this just a hard thing, um, you know, in general, it's hard for humans. Um, how would you even teach a machine like this? How would you how would you create training data? So if you do want to create an AI system that is going to help and is going to learn this, it's obviously you can't have just one doctor teach them. You need to do something uh, more. And this is a great example of what's involved in creating training data and why data itself is always a highly non-trivial part of any machine learning problem. So if our goal is say, okay, we don't have enough doctors to do this, um, we would like to get assistance or to give doctors at least, you know, make them help, help them help doctors or nurses diagnose this faster. How can we do this? We'll need to somehow teach them some of the knowledge that humans have. So next slide, here's how we get around this disagreement problem. What we'll do is we're going to create like a whole system um, in order to create training data in which we have a whole set of doctors, each of whom is an expert, and they'll all grade independently. Um, a bunch of images that we have of different stages of diabetic retinopathy. And then we're going to have them discuss. So what the Google team did, there's a Google team who you know, sort of worked on this system is, next slide, they created an entire interface that let people, like doctors, look at images of people's eyes. And then they would have a whole discussion when they disagreed. And do, during this process, so-called reconciliation process, they came up with a set of uh, high quality data that could be used to train a system. Okay, so that is an example of how you would get data to train a system to fill a gap. But of course, there's more than just the data. You need to come up with a model. So next slide. What they did uh, is they started uh, from a model that was previously trained. Next slide. And so they took a publicly available model, something that had been trained on a system called ImageNet uh, that basically knew how to identify a thousand different real world things, normal common sense things, broccoli, fire trucks, fish, tigers, stuff like that, that had nothing to do with medical uh, uh, images at all. But then, next slide, what they did is they took that pre-trained model and they added to it 130,000 images that had been labeled by these ophthalmologists who had been, you know, having discussions about what the right label was. Next slide. Um, and doing that, next slide, uh, they were able to actually end up with something, uh, next slide, that would diagnose uh, or give potential diagnoses for diabetic retinopathy. Okay, so that all led to a system um, that, you know, would look at these images and have suggestions that would say, oh, here's what the system estimates the probabilities of these various conditions are. Okay, now there's a lot to consider when you do something like this. Uh, next slide. If, uh, one thing is just, okay, how do we handle all of this data? correctly? How do we incorporate privacy design principles? Um, and, you know, next slide. Um, if I do this, if it, as they did this, they had a lot to go on. You know, there's transparency, there's consent, there's security access. And the nice thing is, next slide, that they don't have to start from scratch on this. And an important issue here is that this is an area in which health regulators already have been thinking about automation for a while. And the point is that it's not necessarily that uh, the, there are various laws involved involving you know, medical data, how you use medical data. None of those were necessarily written with this particular kind of AI in mind. However, they're all highly relevant to the case. And these, these were all used as guides in helping people figure out what is the right thing to do, um, what is the right way to treat data. Okay, what about um, even aside from sort of you maybe legal and privacy issues, what about bias? This is something that's come up a lot. Next slide. Um, and you know one of the principles that, that Google has is to avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. And next slide, we can think about what are the types of biases um, that might come up in a situation like this? Um, what are groups that need to be well represented in the data? Next slide. And the issue here is that, you know, 
there are some that are obvious, like, okay, you know, age, sex, or I actually wouldn't say obvious, but these are standard examples from demographics that you don't want to be sexist, for example, you don't want to be ageist. But the point is that everything is very contextual with machine learning. And in this case, there are two other issues that became very important. Next slide. Um, and if you think about them, you might realize, wait, there's eye-related stuff, pupil size. Like that's not an issue we necessarily think about as a way that a system can be biased, but it absolutely could be potentially. So it's important to come up with a wide array of pupil sizes in these images that it's trained on. Similarly, image quality turned out to be very important as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so all of this led to the creation of a system called ARDA, an automatic uh, assessment, um, I shouldn't say diagnosis, but assessment of the situation. And this is a system that basically looks at images of the fundus of the back of the eye and comes out with um, sort of a suggestions about what it sees is going on, its suggestions for what doctors should look at and why. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, there's actually a little video we have that sort of shows this system in action. We show, you know, someone will basically look into this machine um, and then, uh, you know, photo gets taken and then an assessment comes out, which a doctor can look at and they can sort of understand what's going on. Okay. And can now, I can just jump yeah. in here for a sec, uh, Martin? Wh one of the things about this slide is that this is the explainability to the doctor and the nurse about why the system <clears throat> why the system decided, for instance, in this case, that the right eye was okay, didn't have uh, RD, but the left eye uh, had severe um, uh, DR. And so, and it's trying to explain why it felt this way. And, and that turns out to be very important. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So if we go to the next slide, um, another way of looking at this is, you know, how would you um, assess the performance? It turns out that assessing performance of classifiers is surprisingly complicated. There's always this trade-off between false positives and false negatives that needs to be tuned. And so often people represent this with a curve, um, a sensitivity specificity curve as shown here. Here up and to the left is good. You basically wanna be like as sensitive as possible. Um, and what you see is the green curve is where you can tune this system. And essentially it is better than generalists. It is either as good or not quite as good as some specialists, depending on the specialists. Okay, so this is a system, um, you know, it led to academic papers. And in fact, there are some screening sites that are open. And next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about the results because this is interesting too, is that it turns out that in fact, on a lot of measures, uh, this actually worked well. It, nurses required less reliance on specialists, wait times for referrals went way down. But it's also important to add that there were, it was not a 100% slam dunk here either, that there were issues with like, as much as they had tried to incorporate a lot of low quality images, it turned out in the field, they came up with more of those than they had expected. And in particular, the trade-off um, between when you need to go to a doctor or not to get an official diagnosis, it felt like making that trade-off was hard and, and that it was very you know context specific. That if you live in say a big city that has lots and lots of doctors and you can get an appointment very easily, maybe seeing a doctor is no big deal, getting a referral instead of an assessment on the spot. If you're going to have to travel days, um, maybe you would set that trade-off differently. And it gives you an example of the subtleties um, of this. Uh, okay, and over to you, Fernanda, to finish it off. Okay, so just to close up, um, a few takeaways from both the principles of machine learning, but also this case study. Um, one that I hope you take with you is data is critical across all these systems. Even though we talked about very different kinds of systems, some of them were generating text, some of them were you know, classifying images. Um, training data is the driver both for good performance and for problems, biases and other things. So data is super important. The other takeaway is the fact that we can explain some things some of the time. A lot of times we can't explain the entire system 
And so more work is needed uh, and it's very contextual. I hope you, you saw with the kinds of explanations to, to physicians, um, how, uh, how that works. Um, and so again, a lot of work happening in that, um, in that area. And finally, this question of human AI interaction, which I think is incredibly important, right? So today, when you go to AI conferences and, and the field is moving super fast, the truth is a lot of the most of evaluation is done uh, with benchmarks, which tend to be very specific ways of measuring performance, very mathematical ways of, math me of measuring performance. We believe that we need to start moving these evaluations in addition to the benchmarks to also um, have people in the loop. So who is your user for your system? How do they work with your system? And so you know, directing resources towards understanding people in the loop of these systems, societal consequences. How are these trade-offs, as Martin was saying, um, in the real world? It's very different to apply uh, some of these uh, some of these systems. So, it would be wonderful if we started moving. And I, I think some effort is being made, but we need even more effort to move the field really to incorporate evaluation with humans in real world situations. Uh, I think a lot of good things can come, come from that. And with that, um, we're gonna stop here and would love to take some questions. Yeah. So one thing, looking at the Q&A right now, um, I see that uh, there's both questions at the end and the beginning, several questions about this idea of reusing data um, and also about reusing models. And I, I think this is really interesting. Um, so I'm gonna to try to answer a couple of questions at once. Um, one person asked, um, you know, can you, how often can you reuse data? And I think there, I'm gonna sort of say there's technical and non-technical aspects to that. Um, at a technical level, in a sense, it's not like you can sort of use up data across different tasks. So certain data sets like the ImageNet data set has been used over and over again. By a lot of researchers. The danger with that is, you know, potentially you have many models that are all doing the same thing or all suffer from the same problems if there's an error. Um, there's a non-technical issue, which is that sometimes data is collected for one purpose. Um, can you always use it for a different purpose? And there, I think there's both ethical and legal issues that come up. And so that's another issue. There's also a thing that I see, there've been a couple of questions where people are asking this thing that I think is very natural, where they're, they're saying things like, why would something trained on broccoli and tigers be good for medical diagnosis? And you know, this is a genuinely interesting question and a little bit of a surprise to the researchers in the field that it turns out that pre-training on one thing can be useful on totally different tasks. And I don't know that there's a great explanation for this. I mean, I think the going theory is that there are certain subtasks that are similar, like very low level things like edge detection, which you might learn um, in recognizing a tiger that will be useful in a medical situation. Another way to think about it is that as humans, this is exactly what we're doing. Like we're trained on looking at, you know, other people and chairs and tables and trees. And yet the doctors themselves are able to learn to recognize medical imagery with that background, um, probably better than, you know, a little baby would. Um, but I think it's a very good point. It, the expressing sort of surprise at that fact, it shows that you are definitely understanding how interesting it is. Um, yeah, and I see um, on that, you know, just a follow up on data. Um, one of the questions here is what is the role of synthetic data in machine learning and where are op opportunities and risks in your view? So one of the things in which uh, synthetic data can be helpful so with my little example with the banana, right? It was very easy for me to retrain my little model and make sure that the banana was seen from all different uh, sides and, and make my, my system very robust. Truth is in the real world, um, that may not be as easy. So for instance, um, I'll give you one example that happened in, in, the, in the real world with an 
um, API that Google put out called Perspective API. This was a system where they were trying to deal with toxic comments, user-generated toxic comments on websites, okay? And so they did, they, they collected as many examples as they could. They uh, trained, and this was done in, in conjunction with the New York Times because the New York Times has interest in moderating their own comments. They don't have enough hours in the day to read all the reader comments, and still they want to make sure that they put good comments up. Um, and so the system was being trained on the notion of toxicity. And uh, both the folks at Google and the folks at the New York Times decided, yes, it's working well, let's let's launch it, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And what they realized, and, and it was, but then once they put it up, uh, put it up on the on the web, launched it. They allowed they they thankfully they allowed people to play with this API and to say enter whatever comment and see whether it's toxic or not. And very quickly, that uh, things like I'm a woman was kind of toxic, or I'm a black woman was even more toxic, or I'm a queer black woman was very toxic. And they're like. Oh, this thing is broken. What is going on? What's so? The folks at Google went back and did a whole analysis of the data. Again, this is data in the real world um, of comments, of user comments. And the thing they realized is that in the training data, when you had very short comments and they had these words like either woman or black or queer, in the training data, in the real world, these very short comments were indeed toxic. So that was what the system was trained on. That's what it was seeing on in the real world. So with the with the help with of the community, they started asking, giving give us a lot of examples of benign short sentences with these trigger words, so that the system can see diversity, right? And so the community started sending examples, and then they also generated some synthetic data because they knew the kind of data they needed that would be helpful to make the system more diverse. So sometimes this is how synthetic data can help. If you have edge cases or you have places where you know you have very little data, but you want to make your system more robust, synthetic data can be very, very helpful. Um, if you just generate a massive data set that is synthetic generated, you may want to be very careful and really analyze your data set and make sure that it doesn't have a lot of problems that we see in the real world. So you always want this um, deep engagement with the data, whether it's generated uh, or, or not. There's a question that is a recent one, but I think it's, it's an important one. So I'm going to answer it. When should you not use machine learning? Um, and I think that is a great question to ask. So what I would say is that one important thing is that machine learning probably should not be the first thing that you try in any given situation. So one classic thing is that, or mistake that one sees in industry is people go to create something new and they get all excited. They're like, oh, and we're gonna use AI for this. Um, often something much simpler will work just as well and is easier to maintain and understand and so forth. So one answer is don't start with machine learning. Um, another situation is, so in basically the general principle is if there's a better way to do it without machine learning, then do it that better way. There's another aspect to that question, um, which is what are sort of, when should you stop using machine learning? And I think this is something that is not thought about enough, which is that it's important to monitor whatever system you have and make sure that it is doing the right things. And if there are bugs that you hadn't thought would happen, keep very careful track of those. Um, you know, if you have a recommendation system that seems to be recommending things that are not what you wanted, that's something to pay attention to. If you, um, see that a system that is generating text is generating text that is causing users problems in some way. Like pay attention to that. And there are often sort of new failure modes that need to be looked at very, very carefully. So I would say it's always important to ask yourself, is machine learning necessary? And is machine learning still necessary if you're using it already? 
Great. Uh, one question here um, about government processes. So many government processes, example, disability program, eligibility review, et cetera, have law or regulation that requires human review of cases while also suffering significant case backlogs. Without rewriting the governance, how can ML complement these processes? I think that's a great question, which is, and, and I think this is the, for us, the really exciting point, which is how can you design certain ML systems to work in conjunction with uh, human processes, right? So humans in the loop working with these systems. And so one of the things, I'll give you one example that comes to mind um, in terms of backlogs of, of things to look at, um, which is actually the COVID pandemic. So obviously once the pandemic got going and every the world shut down, one of the biggest questions in uh, machine learning uh, scientists' minds was how can we use this technology to help? And there was a diversity of uses of the technology. Obviously, some of them directly related to, to drugs, to, to understanding the virus. But there was a very different kind of use that turned out to be uh, kind of much more pedestrian, if you will, but very useful. And this is where I think it could have some, it could be useful in terms of government processes as well. It turns out that one of the things that was super useful to the entire scientific community during the pandemic was the fact that there were libraries that allowed machine learning to read all the hundreds of papers that were being published week in, week out, and summarize those papers so that scientists could very quickly try to scan through all these new scientific breakthroughs and try to understand, no, I, I'm dealing with kids. What do we know about kids? I'm dealing with this kind of population. What do we know about this kind of population? And so again, it's not like coming up with a new drug, but it is trying to get rid of, or at least addressing some of the backlog. And so I would, I would, um, you know, recommend broad thinking um, in terms of how this technology can be useful in terms of government processes. So if there are backlogs, is summarization something that would be useful? Is there anything that could help your personnel uh, take care, address some of, some of the pain points? Fantastic. I think we have time for one more question because we're almost at noon. So if, if there's a question, Martin or Fernanda, that you'd like to take from the chat or maybe synthesize, that would be great. Let's see. I think one thing that I would like to say is that there's an early on question about is there the possibility that machine learning or AI is going to be affected by cultural aspects in designing or explaining? And I think this is a great question. And I would say there's two ways of answering it. One is to note that software already is affected by cultural aspects um, and often in very subtle ways. You know, you'll have a forum that assumes that everyone has a first name and a last name, which is just not true uh, necessarily across the world. And that's not AI. And so we're already dealing with this. But there's another thing going on here, especially as we think about um, systems that are generating data, or maybe looking at images in new ways, which is that absolutely, this is a, a huge issue to think about. And I think it speaks to the importance of both diversity in human testers um, and also in people who are creating the systems um, that I think there's a huge need to be thinking globally um, because often these things are you know, deployed globally and even internally in one place, just how do you make sure that you have tested on as many kinds of people as a diverse group as possible. 